Thank you very much for the invitation and for that uh, very kind in introduction. I'm really excited to be here today to tell you about uh, one, uh, one of the exciting stories of uh, science that's been happening in the 21st century. Um, and to start off the story, I, I, um, before I get there, I wanted to tell you just a little bit more uh, about me. One thing I wanted you to know is I have an identical twin brother. <laughs> Um, maybe you can tell, maybe not, which one of us went into uh, classical music composing and which one of us became a scientist. Um, but we both used to love playing video games. This is a screenshot from a pretty obscure uh, old school Nintendo game where I fell into a black hole in like you know fourth grade or something and I got really curious about them. And that stuck with me in high school when I came across this library book which was um, telling me all about black holes and um, by the time I got through the first few chapters, I started wondering, well, what, what does this guy do for a living? And I realized you could actually work on stuff like this. And so I was sort of hooked on it by then. And then one more thing I wanted to tell you, this is a picture of um, uh, my high school math teacher. Um, and this is the sign that was in his room and still is in his room. It says, don't be afraid to ask scare quote dumb questions. I show this to all my students in my classes, and I always mention this to my students in research. Um, when I was in college, in one of my lab classes, I was sitting there and the professor was incomprehensible and I looked around and I was scared because everyone was going like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I thought I must be the dumbest guy in there, but it turns out they were just better at covering it. So, um, so that's, uh, this, this is a professor, who, uh, this is a teacher who had really strong influence on me when I started asking questions about stuff like this. Okay, so black holes are something like they show up in video games. They're always popular. They've been in the media for a while. Here's one of my favorite examples. I'm going to play for you for a second. Well, is created. Ken. What are the 50s? Yes. Final frontiers for 1,000, Alex. Tickets aren't needed for this event, a black hole's boundary from which matter cannot escape. Watson. What is event horizon? Yes. Literary character, APB, for 200. Okay, so... <laughs> I think I'll always be geeking out about this. It's Jeopardy, black holes, and the robot got the question right. So <laughs> actually, the kind of uh, uh, computer hardware that um, they were using is a bigger example of the same kind of computer clusters that I'll be showing you a little bit later that we use to uh, compute what happens when black holes crash into each other. OK, so here's another case a little more recently. Last. Uh, in February 2016, very briefly, all the politics and news and all the other stuff got pushed to the side. And there was this picture on the front page of the New York Times website of two black holes. And what I want to do is tell you the story of this, of this picture. This is, um, this is actually uh, a picture uh, made from a supercomputer calculation that my students and I did at Cal State Fullerton. And I want to tell you what this means and why we're all excited about it. Um, so spoiler, the, the computation itself is like not the reason we're all excited about it. <laughs> so I have to give you a little bit of background. There's this awesome toy that demonstrates this outside if you want to play with it on the way out. It's one of those funnels where you can spin little balls around in it. That's how I want you to think of gravity. The sun's mass curves the space around it, and the planets try to move in the straightest possible lines they can, but because of gravity, they end up moving in curved paths. And the, and, and the stronger the gravity, the more steeply it's curved. But the sun doesn't just suck everything into it. The planets can still go around in orbits. It's the same for black holes. So here's a picture, how you can picture a black hole. So like uh, uh, IBM's Watson uh, computer told us, um, the horizon of a black hole, that's the place where if you go inside, you're not coming back. So that's, it's, it's, it's uh, nothing including light, so no messages that you might want to send can get out from inside the horizon. Um, that's what makes a black hole a black hole. Black holes are formed um, from uh, very large stars in space. When they run out of fuel to do nuclear reactions and they die, they make black holes. Um, here's a picture. This is just a, a drawing. Uh, um, this is a black hole uh, uh, horizon. It's just a sphere. But a lot of times, in order to show how the space is curved, it's hard to do curvature in four dimensions. I've seen on the web some people can solve four-dimensional Rubik's cubes, but I have no idea how they do it. So what most people do is they would just, like imagine sliding a piece of paper through here and just cutting it out. So now the horizon is a circle. And I'll show you how the space outside the horizon is curved. And it looks like this sort of funnel shape. But this isn't, 
And what this means, it's just like the picture before with the sun in the middle, except now instead of a star, there's just a horizon. You can go through there. But if you do, it's bad for your health and you're not coming back. <laughs> so let me give you a feel for what these weird objects are like. What, how big are black holes? There's two different ways you can get at that. They come in sort of two flavors. Um, the stellar mass black holes are sort of a few or maybe 30-ish times as massive as the sun. But there's also these millions or billions of times as massive as the sun black holes that live in the centers of galaxies. I'm going to mostly be interested on the smaller kind in the talk today. Um, so if you want to know how, how big they are, though, it turns out the size of a black hole, um, it just depends on the mass. You take the mass of the black hole, divide by the mass of the sun, and multiply that by three kilometers. So even though they're so massive, they're tiny. So here's uh, Google Maps, where I, when I got some directions recently, um, GPS directions also are an example of using Einstein's theory of gravity. It turns out the timing on the GPS satellites wouldn't work without relativity. Um, and let's see, so we're here in the Discovery Cube, and this is my office in Cal State Fullerton, if one of my students, we're all theorists, so if we screwed up, tried to do an experiment and made a 10 solar mass black hole somehow centered right here on Cal State Fullerton, that's how big it would be. So we'd be toast, but it doesn't even reach to like downtown Los Angeles or Glendale. So imagine squishing 10 times the mass of the sun into an area so incredibly small. If you squish the earth all the way down to be a black hole, this is how big it would be smaller than a golf ball. So these things are both incredibly massive and incredibly small. And as a result, scientists come up with this imaginative name, compact objects, to describe things like this, because they're so big but so small. There's one other thing about black holes I want you to know about, and I'll do a little imaginary experiment to show it. Black holes spin. I love things that spin around. Um, my wife can t tell you maybe I'm, I have a little unhealthy obsession with spinning things, but I get to work on spinning black holes for a living, so it's all all right. Here's a black hole that's not spinning. Let's do an imaginary experiment. Now, someone's got to write the paper to the journal, so I'm going to stay out here at a nice safe distance. Here's one of my students, Haroon. So he's going to dive headfirst into the black hole. And if the black hole isn't spinning, he'll just fall straight in, just like you'd expect. But if we imagine a different experiment where the black hole is spinning 99% as fast as it theoretically can, well, I've got to write the report to the National Science Foundation, so I'm going to stay out here. Haroon, he's going to dive in head first, but now the black hole spins space around it, and Haroon gets pulled into rotational motion, even if he started out trying to go straight in. In the shaded gray region, it's impossible for Haroon to resist orbiting the black hole. He can't go straight in, even if he wanted to. So that's just another little weird thing about how black holes behave. So to an individual black hole, if you want to know everything there is to know about it, all you need to know is how fast is it spinning and how big is it. But what if you put two of them together? This is a great example of a nonlinear idea. The whole is not just the sum of the parts. If you put two black holes together, you don't just get a black hole. You get black holes that collide and send out gravitational waves. So let me show you gravitational waves. This is a computer calculation one of, another one of my students, Nick, uh, did. Um, you can see the little funnels in the middle. They're a little small. Maybe if you squint, you can see the funnels as the black holes spiral together and merge. They spiral together as they lose energy. Let me play it again. And then as they do, they send out these ripples, these spiral ripples. They get stronger and stronger, and then the holes merge. These are like water ripples on a pond if you throw a rock in. They travel at the speed of light. It's like a shock wave in the universe. Space and time are shaken by uh, the black holes. It's such a violent collision. So that's what happens when the black holes collide. You wouldn't want to be anywhere near it. But far away, they don't do much. Here's a little movie showing what a gravitational wave would do if it flew into the screen, if it just passed straight into the screen. Let me play it again. So it would take a ring. This is supposed to be circular, but uh, I did my slides four to three, and apparently the world's gone to high definition now. So this was supposed to be a circle. <laughs> and it just stretches and squeezes them. And this movie is showing a stretching and squeezing by 10%. But in real life, because they're so far away, even when these monstrously big black holes smash into each other, they would only stretch and squeeze these little balls by 0. 0.000. This is 21 zeros percent, or 19 zeros. OK, 10 to the minus 21. So they're incredibly small. 
This is so small that when Einstein wrote this paper, I can't read this in German, but another professor in our Gravitational Wave Center, uh, Josh Smith, translated it. What he said here, although Josh says the German's a lot more elegant, he says, one can see that A, which is how strong the gravitational waves are, must have in all conceivable situations a practically vanishing value. That's Einstein's fancy way of saying, yeah, these exist in theory, but in practice, you can just forget about measuring them. Well, this was 1916. This is 100 years later. Thousands of scientists um, have been uh, designing and implementing and troubleshooting these experiments and doing experiments within the experiment, trying to design machines that can measure stretching and squeezing so impossibly small. 10 to the minus 21 for these instruments where one arm is four kilometers long. So this is two and a half miles of vacuum tube here. So is this. The stretching and squeezing is a thousandth the size of a proton. It's so incredibly small. This is, they, these are machines set out to make the most precise length measurements ever. One is in a nuclear waste site in the desert and the other is in the swamp over here. They had a problem. Well, they had a lot of problems. They had rats. <laughs> rats are a problem because they urinate and that's acidic. That was a problem with the vacuum. They also had a problem with people sh shooting shotguns because the government built this big tube here. So they, they had to do a little outreach to put a stop to that. So, okay, so one night, four in the morning, just after they finished upgrading these, they were doing an experiment trying to figure out what would happen if someone was driving along near here and slammed the brakes on in the car. That can shake the earth. And even though these are exquisitely isolated, that little bit of that shaking of the earth can shake the little objects. They're actually mirrors they have at the end of these arms just a little bit, enough to mess up the experiment. But the GPS stopwatch, which they needed to sync up with the experiment because everything uses GPS time, was broken. So at 4 in the morning, they went home. Less than an hour later, they just left the detectors on, and they picked up the first gravitational waves ever. Those waves have been traveling across the universe for a billion years, and they got here less than an hour after they stopped monkeying with the experiment so they could actually measure it. So how can they possibly do this? Well, here's a little animation that shows you. So this is just a simplified illustration because I'm a theorist. I, I'm not going to show you how they really build it. But basically, they send a laser light into this thing called a beam splitter. I'm going to play it again more slowly. Half the light bounces off like a mirror. It's a 50% mirror. Half goes through. Then they go down this 2.5 mile vacuum tube, bounce off, light comes back. And then when they recombine, the lengths are adjusted so that the waves cancel out. The peak of the yellow wave is always with the trough of the blue wave. But when a gravitational wave comes by, it stretches and squeezes the space so that the waves don't cancel out anymore. When you try to measure something small, measuring differences from nothing is one of the best ways to go. And that's how they do it here. So when the waves, when the space gets stretched and squeezed, you see a little blinking light. And then a little camera over here picks that up. So that's how they, we use lasers and mirrors, that's the short answer, to measure a change in length so impossibly small. So right after they went home, the instruments recorded this. You can look at this graph like a seismograph. You can think of it like that, like time is going this way, and then it's showing how much stretching and squeezing in units of that tiny number, 10 to the minus 21. You see a bunch of noise here at first, but then you see the, the waves. This panel over here compares the waves from the two detectors. There's one in the desert and one in the swamp, so that when you compare them, yeah, their noise is totally different over here. But then when you see a signal, the signals agree with each other. The bottom part here is trying to show you the time versus the frequency. They sort of ramp up in loudness and pitch. So it's sort of like whoop, something like that. I can't do it very well, but I have a recording. It turns out the frequencies of these waves, the frequency that the mirrors move back and forth is a frequency we can hear. So if you take this recording and plug it into some speakers, you can turn it into a sound. The waves of gravity aren't made of sound, but you can play it back as another way to illustrate it. So that lower pitched whoop, that's what the detectors heard in a sense. The higher pitched one is just to make it easier to hear because our ears aren't quite so good down there sometimes. So we're scientists. We spent a while making sure everything was true. And then we, of course, had to write about it. This is the cover of the journal that we published the thing in. 
These are computer calculations I'll tell you more about in a bit that shows what happened. The black hole's horizons, these little spheres, got closer and closer together as the holes went around until they made this weird shape. Uh, some people called this a flying potato because that's what they look like, this potato-shaped black hole that then settled back down. This black hole was 39 times the mass of the sun. You can tell that by the precise way that the frequency goes up, the precise way it goes whoop. This one was 31 times the mass of the sun. The final black hole, after they whirled around at a quarter of the speed of light and smashed into each other, was 67 times the mass of the sun. So if you look at the numbers, they don't quite add up. So three times the mass of the sun got converted into gravitational wave energy. It's like annihilating three suns, and all of that converted into pure energy. This is the most powerful event we've ever seen. This all happened in a fraction of a second, all that energy getting radiated, and yet it's totally invisible. So these things are the most violent explosions anyone's ever observed, the most powerful event anyone's ever sensed, and yet it was invisible. There was no light at all. It was all sent into waves of gravity. And because this was so far away, a billion light years away, it took a billion years for the waves to reach Earth. And by then, just like when stars are far away, they look dimmer, by the time the waves got here, they were dimmer. And LIGO, the experiment, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, finally put the O in its name and made its first observation. And that's what this is showing. And that's what we're also excited about. And here's a bunch of people from Cal State Fullerton who were co-authors uh, on the paper, including some of our alumni who were students uh, at Fullerton. So what did we do? This is a picture uh, from uh, this is a picture from the press conference where we. Uh, I was actually surprised. Uh, some of the Los Angeles media didn't go to Caltech; they came to see us at Cal State Fullerton, and our students were there to answer questions. Um, these are some of our students. These are th this is what science looks like. It's not Einstein sitting in a room. That's what people picture, but it's more like this. It's these groups of people who are working together. And we did things like, um, uh, uh, Josh Smith leads an experimental group that does things like making, like making sure the signals were real and helping to improve the mirrors, the optics, so that they, the light bounces off the way you want it to. Um, Dr. Reed uh, leads, leads a group that did things like figuring out how to find such a faint signal inside the data. Um, when you've got lots of, when you're trying to listen for something so faint, so the mirrors aren't moving that much. How do you do that? But the thing I'm going to focus on is computer calculations. Because once LIGO saw this, if you're a theorist like me, you want to try to see if their measurement agrees with what Einstein predicted 100 years ago. So I was actually waiting to go to a meeting with someone else um, who knew about this before I did. And he just sent me a quick text on Skype and said, I can't make the meeting. And I said, why not? And he said, have you heard about this event? And I'm like, what event? And he said, why don't you come to the meeting? It's going to be interesting. And, that's, and so that's how I, I first heard about it. And we spent the next months trying to make sure it was real and then getting ready to tell the story. One of the things we wanted for a story was this. This is a slow motion movie. I'll play it again because I don't think, uh, loops on Keynote, but this is Windows, so I have to do it again. I had to get at least one Windows bash in the talk. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a movie showing what it would look like up close if you had a camera in slow motion watching as the black holes, their gravity is so strong, it warps the light like a lens and makes this trippy pattern on the background stars. Um, and this movie was rendered by Haroon. Um, he, I, since I didn't dump him into a black hole, he was still around and he could make this movie. <laughs> he used this computer, Nusha, um, just graduated uh, last year. She uh, was our assistant system administrator and here she is um, when we were expanding the cluster, running all these networking cables so that the computer parts could all talk to each other. And then um, another one of my students here is in Scotland presenting some of the work she's done with some of these calculations. So the students are, were involved in doing computations and in telling the story of this. So they got to participate firsthand in the discovery. So let me finish up showing you the results. The pink and blue are time versus amplitude. It's a way of, like a seismograph, it's showing you how big was the wave, how much were the mirrors wiggling back and forth. This yellow curve is our supercomputer calculation. Back here, they don't agree because back here, you're just seeing noise in the instrument. But here, when the waves get louder, they agree really, really well. And this is just a first cut of the kind of calculation that gives us confidence that not only was this a gravitational wave, but it came from colliding black holes just like Einstein predicted. So what's next? 
Well, we're going to test as precisely as we can. Was Einstein right, even under these crazy extreme conditions? Maybe some other theory is right. Also, all the textbooks suddenly became out of date, and now we've got to tell everybody that we have this brand new sense to observe the universe, like none we've ever had before. Before now, if you wanted to learn about the universe outside the solar system, all you had was light. Now we have a whole new spectrum of gravitational waves. So this is a story of um, what LIGO's been able to see so far. There's one candidate in the middle. We're not sure if it's real. I'm not going to talk about that. This is the one I just talked about. Scientists always give these really dramatic names. This is a gravitational wave that happened in 2015 on September 14th. So Christmas, it, the, so the December 26th, Boxing Day, universal time, but in California, Christmas evening, I was about to go for a walk with my wife Elizabeth, who's here in, in the front row, and well, what did I do? I checked my email, because of course, you know, I know how to be romantic, so I've got my phone out checking email on Christmas e evening, right? And the email was exploding with all this stuff, uh, and they were talking about, is this real? Could this be real? And that was actually ended up being their second gravitational wave that they detected. The chirp was a lot longer at a higher frequency. Um, it was in the frequencies that LIGO could sense a lot longer because the black holes were smaller, as it turns out. And so someone drew this cartoon that I liked. Um, oops, almost forgot LIGO. And they actually published this before LIGO announced that they saw the second wave. So there was a little bit of, oh, I don't know if they should have drawn that. But if you weren't in LIGO, you didn't get the in-joke. And so they felt OK about it. <laughs> and we're going to look for other things, like neutron stars almost as small as black holes smashing into each other or stars blowing up. We're going to try to make the experiment look farther. Here's one of the actual mirrors, the kind of mirrors that they would put in LIGO. Here's one they brought to Cal State Fullerton uh, for Dr. Smith and his students to see how the light bounces off of it. This is 40 kilograms and about $300,000 or something like that. So I, I didn't, they didn't want the theorists anywhere near it, I guess. I, I certainly didn't touch it. Um, this is a picture to show how much, how impro these improvements can help. If you were to make this is what um, the experiment could see in 2010. This blue sphere is what it can see today. The hope is by 2020, it could reach out here. And by seeing you know, maybe twice as much in volume, in, in, twice as far away, it's sensitive to gravitation away from eight times as much volume. And so this experiment out here could be seeing potentially a gravitation wave not just once a month, but maybe once a day. By the way, all these little white dots are not stars. They're galaxies full of stars. These experiments are probing gravitational waves coming from a good fraction of the observable universe. And one last thing, we still are doing computations, not just, we don't just wait for LIGO to measure something. We actually can help LIGO make measurements. Besides making the optics better and making the, the noise smaller, Here's another noisy situation from 2015. This was actually just a month before the gravitational wave event. This is, uh, I'm right here. Um, this is my w uh, wife. We just got married. Um, and here's uh, one of my colleagues, Dan Hamburger, a postdoc at Caltech. And this is a very crowded room. Imagine trying to hear a conversation. Imagine my, my brother is over, over here, and he's trying to hear a conversation, or I'm trying to hear one of his conversations. So if I said, hey, Dan, how are the binary black hole simulations going at my wedding? Not only is Elizabeth not going to be too happy with me, but my brother, that's not going to jump out, right? But he knows his name. So if I say, hey, have you met my brother Jason? Even across the crowded room, he knows my voice, he knows his name, and he could hear that. So we try to compute exactly what those whoop chirps sound like to teach LIGO what they sound like so that it can pick them up even when they're quieter. So that's another thing that we're going to be doing in the future. So to wrap it up, LIGO's taught us that these black holes, tens of times the mass of the sun, exist. They collide in these powerful explosions. Einstein's theory is consistent so far with those observations. This experiment is a technical tour de force of learning all these delicate uh, tricks in order to make the most precise length measurement ever. And our students were all over this. Um, our college's motto includes the words learning through discovery. I think that also is something that I'm really glad to see is coming into the new science standards, that you don't learn by some authority figure telling you how it is, but you learn, you, you learn by asking questions and by going and looking at evidence and looking at observations. They also learn things like computer skills, things that they can take with them, even if they're not going to gravitational waves. If they're going into a science or engineering or tech or math career, they're ready. 
And they're going to take a lot of this hands-on experience with them, working with large data sets. And this last one, I think, is the most important thing that we can give our students. They're learning how knowledge is discovered and that looking at evidence and observations is how you learn things. And I really strongly believe that makes them better citizens and gets them better prepared uh, to be citizens in our country and in the world. So that's what I wanted to tell you about. Um, I had a slide in here that I'd be happy to answer questions, but it sounds like that might happen later. But anyway, thank you for the invitation. I'd be happy to answer questions.